Welcome. I'm David Levi Strauss, Chair of the MFA Program in Art Criticism and Writing here at the School for Visual Arts. Holland Cotter has been writing about art for the New York Times for 21 years now, and I've read nearly everything he's written over that time. His writing is clear, concise, and generous. It is never sloppy, smug, snarky, or pedantic. When he deals with political questions, he does so directly and openly, without cant. He's not a controversialist, but I forgive him for that. It's not in his character as a writer to be so, at least so far. I hear there are books in the works that might surprise everyone. Uh, in preparation for his talk tonight, I wanted to give my students some examples of his writing, and Holland was kind enough to give me a, a list of 10 pieces ranging over 15 years. Rereading them this week, I was struck by the range of his attentions and attractions, from Benin Ivories to Martin Kippenberger, from Joseph Cornell to Kara Walker, from Frida Kahlo to the Turin Madonna. In all of this writing, he wears his love of art on his sleeve. When Holland Cotter was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism in 2009, the Pulitzer Committee said his work was, quote, marked by acute observation, luminous writing, and dramatic storytelling. In 2010, he was given the Lifetime Achievement Award for Art Writing by the College Art Association. He was a 2012 Pointer Fellow in Journalism at Yale University and the recipient of the 2012 Religion and the Arts Award from the American Academy of Religion. Next month, he will be an Alan Leroy Locke lecturer at the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African and, Amer and African American Research at Harvard. He has an A.B. from Harvard College where he studied poetry with Robert Lowell, an M.A. in American Modernism from Hunter College, and a Master of Philosophy degree in South Asian art with a focus on early Indian Buddhist art from Columbia. He was for many years a contributing editor to Art in America and an editorial associate of Art News. And he lives in New York City with his spouse, Joe Roche. Please welcome Holland Cotter. Hi, good evening everybody and thank you for coming here tonight. Um, uh, and I want to, uh, before I start, I want to dedicate this um, talk and, and this evening to uh, Thomas McEvely, who, uh, an art critic who died recently, about 10 days ago, and was a remarkable person and basically a role model for me and for many of my contemporaries. He led the way in um, covering non-Western art in a serious, uh, consistent way. Uh, he wrote beautifully. He was a convert, a con <laughs> what you said, and, <laughs> and, but really, was, he just took on MoMA at a time when it was incredibly important to do that when they did the Primitivism show. And he had a series of articles in Art Forum, which you should track down and read if you haven't, because they're remarkable. He was the voice of the, uh, of the other, speaking for the other, at a time when that needed, needed to happen. Um, and anyway, so I, and uh, he also founded this program, I think. Am I right about that? Yes. So he was the founder of this program. He's, he's why we're all here tonight. So he, he was a remarkable person, um, and uh, I'm very grateful to him. Uh, uh, let me first thank uh, David Libby Strauss, um, who is a wonderful writer and thinker, who I've been writing, uh, reading for years, uh, for inviting me to speak tonight. And I thank you all for coming. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, because this is a lecture series sponsored by the MFA program in art criticism and writing, I want to address my remarks to other writers tonight, sp particularly, and specifically to students of, uh, of writing who may be here this evening. I thought it might be helpful if I spoke a bit about myself as a writer and about some of the things that have shaped my interests in this line of work over the past 40 years. 
I'd also like to mention uh, occasional difficulties I've encountered, uh, in particular a relatively recent one, when I returned from an assignment in Africa and found myself unable to turn that experience, which was a deep and wonderful experience, into words. The trip was, as I say, a work trip, uh, though not an assignment in the sense of being initiated by editors at the New York Times. I proposed it. I chose the four countries that I was going to visit, three in West Africa, Senegal, Mali, and Ivory Coast. Um, Ivory Coast is the, is the Times form of saying Cote d'Ivoire, so I'll continue saying Ivory Coast. That's the way we, we, we write it. And a fourth country was Ethiopia in, in East Africa. Uh, the trip had to be put off some months uh, because Ivory Coast um, had a civil war, and so it was, uh, no one could go there. So we had to delay it for that reason. And when I got to Mali, uh, it was just before the trouble that started there that is ongoing there, although it's s s slightly resol resolved at the moment. Um, <clears throat> so the trip was in flux for, for a long while, but I chose all those, those four countries for, for different reasons. Um, there was, in fact, no news pretext for this trip, um, as there had been in China when I was there in 2008, and the Olympics were coming up and so forth. So the, everybody wanted to look at China at that time. I don't think anybody particularly wanted to look at Africa when, when I was there. I don't think people in particular want to look at Africa now, which is a big problem for me. Um, nor was there even a specific event as a peg, a, a, an art event. Um, though I was in Mali in time to see the pho photography biennial in Bamako, which was an amazing event, uh, worth traveling for alone for that. My reasons for proposing the trip uh, was that I had been writing about African art for years, but I had never been below Morocco on the continent, and I felt I really needed on-the-ground experience I, I wanted to be there, is what I wanted. I wanted to put a, a place, attach a place to all these amazing objects uh, I had been looking at for so many years. Um, what I didn't tell my editors was that my motives also had a very strong personal dimension, a sense of investment uh, that had to do with my own history, uh, which I'd like to talk a little bit about. I think our very early lives shape us, or shape at least some of us, as writers determining what our interests, our interests will be and what art is going to mean for us and what art will end up being the most meaningful to us. Uh, probably everybody in this room remembers uh, how their interest in art began. I certainly remember how mine did. I come from Boston, Massachusetts. I grew up in a museum-going family. Our main museum was the Museum of Fine Arts, which in the 1950s and 1960s was an almost encyclopedic museum. Uh, art museums were not like museums, uh, art museums then were not like museums today. This was before blockbusters, before in-house cafes and all those amenities. Uh, museums were very, they were very quiet places, uh, more like libraries than, than, than the Met is today. Um, there are very few visitors, lots of glass cases, lots of gray walls. Nothing ever seemed to change. Art was just frozen in place. On Saturdays in the winter, uh, in winters, beginning when I was around 10 years old, my parents would drop me off at the MFA and leave me there on Saturday afternoons when they went about their city business. I was basically in the protective custody of the guards, and they all knew me, and because I was a very self-directed kid, they let me go wherever I wanted to go, and I wanted to go everywhere in that museum, and I did. So I got to know uh, the collection very well, very early. The great Egyptian sculptures, John Singleton Copley portraits, Monet landscapes, Netherlandish altarpieces, the stone and bronze Hindu divinities in the South Asian collection that would, had been put together by Ananda Kumaraswamy. I was especially drawn to the Japanese Buddhist hall <clears throat> because it was nearly always empty and had lots of things made of warm colored wood I kept going back to visit the big carved temple Buddhas, and I would sit with them at 10 years old, a daydreamer among daydreamers, on those dark Boston winter afternoons, feeling very protected and included and at home. So that was the primal scene at a time when I was exploring and developing. The most important aspect of that experience was being exposed not just to any one kind of art, but to many kinds of art throughout that museum 
and just by being there, I was getting a sense of the simultaneous existence of many different cultures, and most important, a sense of the equivalence in value of those cultures. Because of that immersion, I think no art has ever felt foreign to me, which doesn't mean that a lot of it hasn't felt mysterious and surprising, and at certain points, overwhelming and beyond my grasp. The one thing I didn't see at the MFA was African art, and that wasn't surprising. In the 1950s, African material was still, for the most part, excluded from fine arts museums. In line with the country's segregational politics, African art was often consigned to a different kind of institution, the Ethnology Museum, a place of artifacts and curiosities, not, quote, art. Yet I was very aware of the presence of something called Africa around me, filtered through African America and the great African diaspora, it was ever present in my life. It was on the radio in the 1950s with Xavier Cugat's sambas and mambos and Harry Belafonte and the late 1950s Calypso craze. Africa was on TV, on the evening news in what had to be 1960. I remember seeing an interview with Patrice Lumumba who had just become prime minister of the new post-colonial Republic of the Congo. To me, at 13 years old and already tuned, on, tuned into language, his name was musical and intriguing. I never forgot it. And I was struck by his appearance. This serious man in a business suit wasn't the African I was familiar with from my grandparents' National Geographic magazines. He was an urbane modern statesman. His murder the following year was the first news death I remember, followed by the death two years later of four young girls in the bombing of an African-American church in Birmingham, Alabama. In a muffled way, the realities of the American civil rights struggle ran, ran beneath all the news at that time. And Africa, via African America, was in my home. My father brought it in with music. He loved jazz and gospel, really loved it, loved all of it. Night after night in the living room, I was hearing Charlie Parker, Count Basie, Dizzy Gillespie, Earl Hines, Fats Waller, Jimmy Rushing, Bunk Johnson, Duke Ellington, Lester Young, Miles Davis, Jelly Roll Morton, Coleman Hawkins, Lionel Hampton, and Billy Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, Dinah Washington, and my favorite, Mahalia Jackson. Upstairs in my room, I had my own music as an early 60s teenager, Little Richard, James Brown, The Marvelettes, and Misa Luba. In the summer of 1964, when I was still in high school, I went AWOL from home. A friend had been sent to reform school in Texas for committing petty, petty crimes, and I decided to pay him a visit. The crimes he was committing was he was breaking into um, houses in my parents' hometown, including my parents' house. And he didn't steal anything. He just, the, the goal was to break into the house. <laughs> so he did that and finally got caught. Um, I scraped together some money, bought a $100 good for a year to go anywhere Greyhound bus ticket, got on a bus and headed south. I had some clothes in a backpack and books in a shopping bag. The books were Thoreau's Transcendentalist Walden, Walt Whitman's Specimen Days, Emily Dickinson's collected poems, poems in the one volume Johnson edition, and Jack Kerouac's, Kerouac's On the Road. Buses were a relatively cheap mode of interstate travel at that time. Most of my fellow passengers were working class. Many were African American. When I crashed for a few nights with my cousin John Elliott, who was then a young English professor at Chapel Hill in North Carolina, I learned that that summer was Mississippi Freedom Summer when Northern College students were coming to Mississippi to register black voters. Three civil rights workers would be murdered before the summer was over. I was warned to be careful, to keep my eyes open, and I did. I got a view of America that didn't seem at all transcendental. As I traveled, I saw whites only signs at public water coolers and blacks served here signs at side, at side windows in restaurants. But in a park in Washington, D.C., I encountered something glorious, a performance by the singer Miriam McCaba, 
who was in political exile from South Africa with her husband, Hugh Mesekela. At that outdoor concert, hosted by Harry Belafonte, I learned what the word apartheid meant. In college, which I entered two years later, I was a literature major, specifically interested in poetry. But more or less by accident, the first course I took was an art course. At that time at that school, all freshmen were, retired, were required to take a science credit. I scoured the listings in search of a doable option and found one, an anthropology course called Primitive Art. Unsurprisingly, this class met in the on-campus Museum of, of Ethnology, which had an old collection of West and Central African masks and sculptures. I ended up loving everything about this course, though at first I found it baffling. It seemed to jumble together all kinds of unalike and to me unfamiliar art the primitive, under the primitive label, Africa, African Oceanic, Pre-Columbian, and Native American. The, Met, the Met's department now of, of African Oceanic and Native American art preserves that um, primitive uh, uh, paradigm. To give some perspective, which of course I didn't have at the time, in America at that point, African art was just beginning to be treated as a standalone academic subject, a distinct field of study within art history. In 1957, Roy Sieber at the University of Iowa became the first person in the United States to, to earn a PhD in African art history. The second PhD was earned by Robert Ferris Thompson at Yale in 1966, the very year I was studying primitive art. As it happened, the graduate student who was leading my section of the primitivism course was an Africanist, an aspiring Africanist. He taught, the, he taught the assigned smorgasbord curriculum, but spent a lot of class time showing rough cut films of masquerades that he had recently shot in West Africa. We were basically his test audience. So we would watch and listen to these amazing films. He audio taped everything and then go out into the galleries and track down the masks that we had just seen being danced. This was fantastic. It was the first time I was fully aware of art that did something, that moved, healed, transformed identities, played with gender, made jokes, was alive, and not just for passive viewing. Later I learned that much of the European church art I had been looking at in the MFA and the Buddhist and Hindu art was potentially alive in exactly the same way. And I would eventually come to see that many of the Western, modern, and contemporary forms that I came to write about many years later, abstract painting, conceptual art, performance art, process art, sound art, installation art, existed without those labels in Africa long before they became vanguard art here. I have to say that viewed from that perspective, the exhibitions like the Museum of Modern Art's current um, and in, in ac inaccurately titled uh, inventing abstraction, 1910 to 1925, seems like a leftover from an, another era. It's uh, so narrow in its scope, totally Western. <laughs> it, it's puzzling to me that it's in the form it's in. Uh, college gave me another gift. The dorm roommate I was assigned my second year was a history major studying Africa, purely, purely by chance. Um, specifically, he was studying colonial, colonial history and post-Lumumba politics. He had just spent a year in Malawi in East Africa in a student version of the Peace Corps called Operations Crossroad Africa, which started, I think, in 1958. So it was a pre predated uh, the Peace Corps by a few years. Uh, he, had, he hung African textiles on the walls of our room, and I learned from him things I didn't learn in the art course about current polit political realities on the continent, a continent that I already knew I wanted to visit. I'm going to jump ahead some years now. Uh, after college, I worked various jobs, a uh, few of which had any connection to art. I traveled a lot, and I came to New York from Europe in the early 1970s. The city was in terrible condition then, on the edge of economic collapse, uh, sociologically a mess, in a blatant form of exploitation, the urban renewal of the previous decade had trashed huge stretches of the outer boroughs, leaving working class immigrants stranded 
a prey to poverty and despair. The mainstream press routinely referred to the South Bronx as a war zone, but never uh, identified that war as a class war, top-down colonialism in action in the United States. The press seldom acknowledged that that war zone was producing some of the great American art of that time, with graffiti and rap both blooming out of the desolation. In the late, in the late 1970s and 80s, I was living with a bunch of artists way downtown near the, near the Trade Center and talking about art all the time. So I started to write about it. Uh, and that, we were lucky at that time because we had a bunch of magazines that were, uh, you, you could write them a note and ask to submit something and they, they would say yes and they would sometimes run those, those reviews. Um, we don't seem to have that anymore except, well, online we do, so that's a whole other thing, but it's, it's a good whole other thing. Anyway, um, so I started to write reviews for New York magazines. Uh, my beat uh, then became the East Village when I moved there in the early 1980s, and I wrote uh, quite a bit about East Village galleries uh, at that time. And then after two or three years of writing about contemporary art in, in the galleries, I just stopped. Uh, the new art was beginning to look um, less and less interesting to me. I felt I wanted to be part of a larger world. I wanted to get back to the art I'd known as a kid at the MFA and in college. I was, I was basically having a crisis of confidence in what I was doing. In the winter of 1983, I saw a show of uh, Japanese Buddhist sculpture at Japan Society, got on a plane, flew to Japan, and stayed for a while, mostly out in the countryside, um, visiting temples and shrines and just walking a lot. I went down to Shikoku and did a part of a pilgrimage route down there, and I just needed that other environment. <clears throat> I got back to New York, and I wanted to write about the art I'd been looking at, the Japanese art I'd been looking at, but I couldn't, um, I couldn't do it. I couldn't at that point do it. All I knew was that I didn't know enough to do it. Uh, I knew that, um, that, that that art and the people who made it deserved my best effort to learn about it before I wrote about it. So I decided to go back to school. I went part-time at night, I went to Hunter College. Uh, they took me as a non-matric into the, um, the graduate program, the MFA program in art history. And um, I got a superb uh, education there, wonderful. I, for a while, took a, a one or two courses a semester just to make sure I had plenty of time to do the extra reading for it. I really, I, it was like I had taken vows. I finally had found something I wanted to do, go f forward with it. And um, I just said, you know, I was in, in for, for, the, for, the, for the long run. Um, <clears throat> at Hunter, I reconnected with my very early interest in Asian Buddhism, uh, which took me to India. I stayed there for a while. And then that took me to the doctoral program at Columbia in South Asian art. Uh, through all, throughout all this time, I had begun writing about contemporary art again. Um, as a critic, I've always considered myself a committed generalist, um, and I still do, though my generalist field was gradually expanding, and I was trying to develop an approach that could accommodate all the different things I was interested in. Um, if I had to state a goal for my my writing, my critical writing, uh, I would probably be, probably be something like um, to write about the art of the past as if it were in the present, and to write about the present art as if it were already a bit in the past. The 1990s were an extremely, um, which is when I started writing at the Times. I started in 1992, uh, writing at the Times as a freelancer, and, um, but a full-time freelancer, so it was every week. I, that was tough, but it, anyway, I did. <laughs> Um, I didn't have a choice. They said, you have to be here all the time or not at all. So I went ahead. Um, but the 90s, the 1990s were, were a very, very stimulating time to be writing about art for me uh, and to be covering new art in America because the very term American art was, was in the process of redefining and broadening itself. Uh, when the economy bottomed out at the end of the 1980s and the art market fell apart, uh, there was some serious gate crashing going on. And a lot of walls came down, and all kinds of new art came in. Not only did the art of African Americans, Asian Americans, and Native Americans gain admittance, so did new art from Africa, Asia, and South America, uh, art that we barely knew existed. 
multicultural, multiculturalism has since proved to be a, a problematic concept. But for me back then, it meant one thing, bringing everybody to the American table with all colors, languages, genders, attitudes, desires. And at that table, we would all not just break bread, but we would cook up new cuisines, whole kinds of new, new nourishment. You probably have to have been around in the late 1980s and 90s to understand how fresh and powerful the utopian spirit was at that time. The art world, for a short while anyway, felt capacious and generous. That was also a time when uh, re revolutionary things were happening in museums in terms of reconceiving ways to present art, specifically non-Western art. The most exciting experiments uh, in New York were happening at a small institution called the Museum for African Art, founded in 1984 by an art historian, Susan Vogel, uh, in, who had been a curator at the Met for uh, many years in the Rockefeller wing of, um, of primitive art. And then she broke free from that and, and started her own museum. <clears throat> uh, the Museum for African Art began in a rented Upper East Side townhouse, uh, then in 1992 moved to a Soho space that had been designed by Maya Lin. Some of its shows were fairly straightforward collection shows, uh, loan shows. The museum itself was a n didn't have a collection. It deliberately narrowed all its um, potentially expensive per peripheral stuff just so it could focus on these revolutionary presentations of art that we didn't know much about. So some of them, were, there were loan shows, and they were, as I say, pretty straightforward. Others were shows like nobody had ever seen before, at least in this part of the world. Um, Africa Explores in 1991 was one of the very first surveys of contemporary art uh, in Africa anywhere. And its format and conceptual range from academic paintings to portrait photography to glass painting to Mercedes-Benz-shaped coffins to genius riffs on traditional forms was absolutely mind-boggling. Um, Tom McEvely actually wrote a, f a, a catalog essay for that show, which is well worth reading today. It's called The Selfhood of the Other, Reflections of a Westerner on the Occasion of an Exhibition of Contemporary Art from Africa, a wonderful essay, and very, very early on in this, in, in th this kind of study. Um, I covered that show for Art in America. I wasn't writing for the Times quite yet. That was 1991. But the museum's most radical exhibition came two years later, when it had moved downtown. It was called Face of the Gods, Art and Altars, <coughs> Art and Altars of Africa and the African Americas. And it was organized by Robert Ferris Thompson, 1966, Yale, PhD. It was made up of, of two dozen altars, from various centers of Africa Atlantic worship. Some were historic objects. They were transportable things, museum pieces, basically, that were brought in and, and sent back to their, their museums when, when the show was over. Others were commissioned uh, by the museum from ritual practitioners who created and consecrated the altars. All the altars were consecrated. The, ri the ritual practitioners would not create the altars in the museum unless they were allowed to consecrate them. To create the altar without consecration was a, a, a silly thing to do, they felt. So that was the part, part of the deal. So the altars were um, created and consecrated by ritual practitioners in the museum, specifically for the show. And when the show was over, the practitioners uh, dismantled the altars, which involved also rituals. Um, the third category of altar was um, consisted of recreations of untransportable altars, such as the sand altars on, on Copacabana Beach in Rio, which are built every year, and they're just candles in the sand, basically, and they're washed away by the tide. So uh, people took photographs of those, sent them to the museum. The museum's um, design team made dioramas, re recreating the, the look of these, of these uh, uh, ephemeral altars, it's sort of natural history museum-type dioramas. So, the fine arts versus ethnological divide that had basically defined museums in my youth were, were brought together here in this, in this show, um, which in, 
in the still very basically you know, ultra conservative world of, of museums, um, shows like this raise all kinds of aesthetic and eth ethical issues about authenticity, about art and sacredness, about the possibility of religious worship within a museum context. I've been told that the, Met, the guards at the Met at the cloisters are given training on how to intervene in the event that somebody tries to use the cloisters as a, as a, a, a site of worship. That's not permitted. Um, did the show work? Was it a success? For me, absolutely. It completely changed my already changing idea of what a museum could be and what a museum could do. The proof of his effectiveness was in the audience. People came who had never been to a museum before, and they came because they had heard about live altars, devotees of Cuban Santeria and Brazilian Condomble left coins and fruits at the altars. They sang songs, they offered prayers. The museum was cool with all of this. For anyone who's been to a temple in, uh, a te oh, temple museums in, in India or, J or Japan, this won't seem so unusual because you, f you find a lot of sort of low-key worship in, in these uh, Indian temple museums, particularly. Uh, but the phenomenon in New York was um, unheard of. Even um, Marina Abramovich at, the, at MoMA, I don't think her devotees, uh, they wouldn't light candles. They may have wanted to, but they weren't allowed to. So it was a different, <laughs> even that was sort of a little bit ap apart. As happened after certain events or shows, Face of the Gods sent me on a reading binge and a research binge, which introduced me to extraordinary scholars in the African field. They've, they've, they've become my, by far my favorite group of art historians because they're adventurous, unuptight, multidisciplinary thinkers. And one of the reasons they are, it seems to me, is because many of them, who are of my generation or slightly older, came to the field not through standard academic routes, but through the Peace Corps or other equivalent um, volunteer programs in the 1960s. So already there's a certain amount of loosened up, even utopian thinking going on with, with these people. Now, I've, I've met many of them now over the years, and I count them friends. Bob Thompson, who dates from a little before Peace Corps time, um, has this kind of utopian thinking too. Uh, he, and I can't help loving the fact that he has spent a long, brilliant career tracking cross-Atlantic cultural exchanges between Africa and the Americas that produced, among many other things, the jazz, blues, and gospel music that filled my childhood home. I heard similar but very different music from almost the moment I landed in Bamako, Mali in late 2011. On my first night there, I went to a music club and heard a female vocalist backed by sensational, a, a sensational drum orchestra who sang what sounded to me like a torchy, bluesy love song. Several of them in a row, strenuous songs. I took them to be, to be pop music. I was wrong. What she was singing, I learned, were classic Wolof praise songs of a kind performed by griots, West Africa's poet historians, to celebrate heroic deeds and people. My misreading on that first night turned out to be an accurate preview of my experience of Africa overall. No assumptions I came with, and I came with many, were accurate. I like to think of myself as someone, as a critic, who resists value-laden binary thinking, high versus low, traditional versus contemporary, genuine versus fake. But I find myself having to work through all of these values, exactly the values that the Museum for African Art was asking us to consider time and again while I was in Africa and afterward. I heard another drum orchestra in Dogon country, far to the north of Bamako accompanying a village mas masquerade. I instantly recognized the masquerade when I saw it. It was one that I had seen in those films back in college in my course in primitive art. And there I was, there it was live, kicking up dust right in front of me all these years later. But it was being performed as a tourist attraction. 
I hadn't considered that possibility before. I come from a part of the world, which is the same part of the world you come from, that has a mania for something called authenticity, for, quote, the real thing, as a benchmark for value in art. And we gauge this realness by a range of fixed criteria, age, rarity, history of use, motives for creation, etc. Did the Dogon masquerade meet those qualifications? A yes or no answer depended on how much information you had or were willing to go after. It was useful, for example, to know that this was a condensed version of a much longer masquerade, which was still performed within the community. You could see that the short version had been carefully prepared for presentation to a paying audience. You could surmise that the money was being uh, used to support Dogon cultural survival. Anyone could see that the performers were fabulous. In a very short time, I went from a position of knee-jerk skepticism to realizing that this performance was as real as real can be. In a potter's village in northern Ivory Coast, artists were producing traditional baule ceramics, but they were also individually creating variations on those forms, freestyle designs, some inspired by images pulled from the internet. The results were surely as, as much contemporary art as anything I had seen in urban galleries in Abidjan or in Chelsea here in New York, though you're not likely to see these, these ceramics in Chelsea or in most museum gift shops in the United States. As long as I can remember, I've wanted to visit the great mosque at Jene in Mali. It was at the top of my list of, quote, historical things that I went to Africa to see, along with the churches at Lalibela in Ethiopia. For years, I've had a picture of the mosque at Jene, which is an enormous adobe mud structure on the wall over my desk at home. When I was actually there, though, the building looked a little different from what I remembered from the picture. What I remembered and was expecting was a building of organic curves and pot-shaped volumes, a little bit like Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. And I knew that one of the things that produced this appearance was the fact that every year, the citizens of Gen A completely recover the mosque with a new coating of mud to make up for the damage done by weather during the, during the year. Essentially, they sculpt it. But standing in front of the mosque there, what I was seeing wasn't organic curves. I was seeing lots of more or less straight, squared off, conventionally architectural lines. It turned out that the building, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, had recently undergone a major conservation effort under the auspices of the Aga Khan Foundation, which is based in Switzerland and specializes in preserving uh, Adobe architecture internationally. One of the mosque's minarets had mysteriously collapsed a few years earlier. The Aga Khan people came in to diagnose the cause and determined that the yearly replasterings were not preserving the building. They were, in fact, undermining it because they were retaining moisture underneath the surface. So it was eating away at the, at the structure. So Aga Khan people did a major overhaul and in the process changed the look of the facade, straightening the lines, making it look more clean and crisp and modern. Uh, they also put it a halt to the replasterings during these years that they, I think it was a five year, four or five year program that they were working on it. And there were no replasterings done during that time. And the question was whether there would ever be again. They said, this is too damaging. It has to cease. So here was this building, which is one of the truly great architectural wonders of the world, in, in my view, composed of layers of expectation. I'm bringing to it an exoticized, frozen-in-time vision based on a cherished photograph clipped from a book, the Aga Khan Foundation is bringing to it an ideal of a building restored to its, quote, original form before overlays of local intervention. The citizens of Gen A, who see this building day after day, are bringing to it a whole range of use values, both practical and spiritual, if you can make a distinction between practical and spiritual. I don't, I don't think you can. Among many other factors in this complex of use values 
for the, for, for the Gene citizens is um, the fact that the annual resurfacing has always been a, an enormously boisterous holiday there, uh, and which is guaranteed to draw international tourism to the city, which is vital to its economy. Um, it's, it's located in a, in a remote part of the country. It's hard to get to. And, in, and it's one of the poorest countries in Africa. So this festival, is, is, is a money generator is a very important one. And suddenly, can't do it anymore. So again, the experience of being in Africa was throwing into the air the neat package of cultural and aesthetic givens that I operated on as a critic. A critic being someone who, through some mysterious combination of knowledge and taste, was expected to dispense thumbs up, thumb down judgments on art. In fact, I, at the time, I had no idea how much of a stake I had in these givens. I didn't realize it until I was back in New York trying to write about this trip. And I found myself again in a crisis of confidence, an information crisis of exactly the kind that had prompted me to go back to school. I didn't know enough. I just, I should say that even after all these years of writing, it's what, 40 years, I guess, I still find writing a difficult thing to do, uh, fraught with a certain amount of anxiety. I know I'm not alone in this. Nearly every time out, no matter what the subject, I experience some form of blank canvas syndrome. Where to begin, how to begin. How do you get the first something down? And will that be the right something? There's this kind of superstition that if, that if you get the right something down, everything else will flow from it easily. Uh, if you don't, then it's going to be difficult. And I go through this you know, every week. <laughs> um, so it's this very exposed moment you know, when you're about to begin. It's this exposed moment. Because you, you also want to, you know, you're going to be, you're talking to your readers now. People are going to read you. And you're, going, you're asking them, you're in inviting them to spend some time with you. And th that's, that's a demand. So uh, you want to make sure you, you're, you're giving them something in return for their attention. Uh, so there's always this difficulty. <clears throat> but what was freezing me up when I came back from Africa and preventing me from, from writing was um, also built into the critical conventions I was working with. Um, the standard format for critical writing in journalism is pretty established, pretty fixed. I'm thinking of the exhibition review, but although essays and, and, and re reporting can also take the same, more or less the same form. Um, but you, you establish a setup, a lead, your first graph, in which you follow, um, which you signal your point of view and your subject, the, your theme. Those are both there up at the top somewhere. Uh, then you <coughs> Uh, follow this with a kind of walk-through description of an exhibition, if you're doing an exhibition review. You end up toward the end, uh, you give a little area at the end there where you can maybe give some exceptions to the opinion, reasons why the opinion you have um, isn't entirely up or down, that there are these little, you know, fine points that you want to mention, and then you conclude, over and out. Uh, this is the standard defining model of art criticism uh, that, I, that I grew up with. It's the consensual version, the one most of us come to depend on, writers I'm saying, come to depend on and stick with for better or for worse. At present, I think it's for worse. It's why we see week after week, at least here in New York, the same handful of critics saying identical things in more or less the same way about the same few shows. Even young critics seem to want to follow this model. It's like listening to one review in stereo. Uh, I think the internet can be a huge help here, but I, in terms of, uh, that's a whole other subject, but it's, it's a big subject, what, what the internet can do for us in terms of uh, varying lo and loosening up our, 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 our forms. Anyway, the model was giving me a lot of trouble because it didn't seem to allow for critical confusion and self-doubt. In fact, it seemed expressly designed to eliminate confusion and self-doubt, expressions of confusion and self-doubt. I've always thought of criticism as being in some sense a form of translation. The critic is translating an art experience she or he has had into a language that people who are, un who are interested but perhaps less immersed in art can follow. 
But what if the writer doesn't feel assured about understanding the full meaning of the original text they're supposed to be translating? What if he or she understands the text just well enough to know that there are possibilities for multiple, radically different translations? This was my situation. Africa refused to be, refused to be uncomplicated, refused to be thematized, or most disconcertingly, to be critically scrutinized in ways that I was familiar and comfortable with. And I want to mention something important here, and that is the reality that writing critically about Africa and art in Africa inevitably takes place under the shadow of the politics of race in America and the continuing legacy of colonialism in Africa. You can't not be aware of these, these things. Let me quote Susan Vogel, uh, former director and founder and director of the Museum for African Art, speaking about scholarship, African scholarship, although she could just as easily be talking about her own museum. Our primary obligation, it seems, it seemed, she's talking about the past, when she's talking about her museum when she was uh, starting it. Our primary obligation, it seemed, was to represent African art makers and users in their own discourse and to make better known the elaboration of their theories. Multicultural, multiculturalist thinking of the 1980s and 90s made us, or some of us, reluctant to speak for the other in situations where we perceive power imbalances. It made us self-conscious in a healthy way, aware of our own limitations, the limitations of our critical conventions. It told us, if we listened, how much we had to learn. I think in the past decade or so, there has been a serious backlash against this expanded and nuanced view of critical writing and the consciousness that it produced. There's been a pullback to a narrow definition of what criticism should be. Basically, consumer reports delivered in neoformalist neo language. And unsurprisingly, it's a concept of criticism promoted by a still racially and ethnically uniform mainstream art world, which, seems, which sees no need to stretch itself. The market, meaning primarily art fairs and, and, and auctions, keep telling it that it's doing just fine. Don't worry. But the world, the real world, <laughs> is large. It's a big place. Travel in any direction and you see this. We need different models to meet that world. And I do think that the models to emulate are there. Tom McEvely's example being one. I think that new forms of critical writing are possible. Forms that combine research, evaluative thinking, autobiography, and poetry. Why not poetry? When it comes down to it, language is the critic's primary medium, the medium for translating experience, which is the critic's primary and most valuable role. The creation of those new forms requires work, reading, looking, asking questions, making mistakes, getting embarrassed, getting blocked. We can't get bogged down in endless laments about how the market has usurped the critic's role. The market is, is at present immovable. You can write about that fact, which is fine, but you might also usefully turn your attention in another direction. Focus on where the market isn't looking, which is in a lot of places. Obviously, I'm speaking to writers here uh, about this when I mention this, and writers in the MFA program for art criticism and writing in particular. Uh, I'm reluctant to give advice because I'm terrible at taking it. But let me offer three short suggestions for writers, um, fellow writers who are working their way into this uh, profession. First, in your work, always begin with questions and doubts, but proceed with passion. I'm encouraging you to be obsessed with art and history and language and to bring an obsessive passion to them. 
It's passion that turns an art experience into a reading experience. And before anything else, we owe our readers a reading experience. Everything follows from that. Second, I encourage you to develop a conflicted relationship with art. All art, to be suspicious of its motives, skeptical of its reputation for truth-telling and transcendence. Over the centuries, many beautiful things have been made for very terrible reasons. I walk, a walk through the Met can be a delight, but it is also a walk through blighted histories. My third and last suggestion may seem to contradict the second one, but it is this. As you do your work, make generosity your mantra. Obviously, this doesn't mean embracing all art and ideas unconditionally. It does mean greeting them and the world at large with a readiness to embrace, to be, among other things, a global citizen. I deeply believe in this citizenship. I guess I always have believed in it. Since I was a kid wandering through the Boston MFA on Saturdays and listening to the African America flowing through my parents' living room at home, and a college student standing in front of African masks in an ethnology museum, very puzzled, then thrilled to learn that they were designed to change whatever lives they came in contact with. And I'm here to tell you that those masks did their job. They changed my life the way art can. And that was more than four decades ago. And they changed my life again just a little over a year ago when I saw them danced on their home turf in Africa. It took me months of reading, thinking, and anxious noodling last winter to figure out how to write about that experience. My editors, God bless them, let me be. And all I could come up with at the end was a short impressionist ac account of that trip. Today, after lots more homework, I could probably write a better one. I bet young writers in this room this evening could write a better one. I hope they do. I can't wait to read you. Thank you. I'll be happy to talk to anybody who wants to ask questions or give answers. <laughs> Yeah. I didn't realize because you were speaking about a writer. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't realize when you mentioned Bob Thompson that you were speaking about the writer. Yeah. And Bob Thompson, the painter, who's died since a long time, was a friend of mine, and at the time probably one of not that many African American painters, a wonderful artist. And I thought about it in connection with what you were saying, because he was painting influenced by all different things, including a very important trip to to Italy for him where he had never been. And so he was, he was also a jazz musician and he combined images of Ornette Coleman and uh, Tuscan landscape and religious medieval ideas and, and his, own, his own mind. And he was an incredible example in a way of what you were speaking about even though he's not right now. It was just wonderful to hear you talk about all those things. Well, thanks Wonderful. a lot. You know, I, I know the Bob Thompson you're talking about, too, and he has a, a fantastic painting right now in the show, in a, in a great show at the Whitney Museum called Blues for Smoke. And that, I think that maybe the painting you're talking about, Ornette Coleman is in that painting. It's like a Garden of Eden with all his jazz yes. uh, heroes. You know, it's so beautiful. And it's right, if you go in off the elevator and you look to the left, that's, it's right facing you. It's a, it's a great thing, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, um, in our many trips to Africa, it's been our experience that in the South, in Zimbabwe, in South Africa, there's wonderful museums, there's a whole art culture, there's galleries in the streets and in, in the main areas of larger towns. <clears throat> but as we got into West Africa, Senegal, Togo, Benin, Ghana, 
we found almost no art, mm -hmm. and certainly no, no contemporary art. I mean, the main museum in Accra, in the capital of Ghana, you know, in five minutes you can see everything and there's not much that's of any interest. Mm -hmm. So do you find that it's very geographic in terms of the quality of the art in different parts of Africa? Or if, you, if it is, why is that? I don't think the, uh, the quality of the art, um, I, I didn't find that, but I did find the quality of museums varied um, incredibly. The, um, Bamako happens to have a, uh, a, a good national museum because it has a very strong leader in, in Samuel Sidibe. He's been there a long time, he's well networked into the government, and um, has put together an ex extremely interesting museum uh, with government support. Um, Ivory Coast Museum, at one time I'm told, was uh, in Abidjan, was a, excellent, but when I was there, it was totally empty. Um, it had been looted during the, uh, I was told, again, it had been looted during the Civil War, and what had not been taken away was in storage. So it's very hard to judge what kind of collection they, they have, but there was nothing to see in any, in any event. Um, and Senegal, um, uh, I would have surprised actually that Dakar wasn't worked together on, on its museum, on its museums, but it wasn't. Um, I had to search hard to find the contemporary um, art because there aren't galleries to go to, or very few. So you have to basically network in and um, get to know a few artists and they will take you to see other artists. And there are a few contemporary um, uh, alternative spaces. There's an excellent one in Dakar actually uh, called um, uh, Raw Material. And it's very, very good. It's an international center. It's just started a few years ago, and the uh, the person who runs it is is very skilled at. Uh, she was she went to a business school, so she knows what she's doing with finances. And um, Ethiopia, um, there's also an alternative space there with a very smart uh, person running it. But they're hard. It's hard to do. There's there's no money. There's very little money. It's not coming from the government. And when it does come from the government, you're inviting meddling. So people don't want that. Uh, it's, it's a tough situation. It's much more together. I haven't been to South Africa, but I, I know from everything I know about South Africa, it's an entirely different ball game. Yeah, yeah. But the art is, is it, this has nothing to do with the art, though. It just has to do with the art institutions because there's some wonderful art being made in, in, the, in West Africa now. It's just hard to find. That's the main thing. I'm curious to know how your perceptions of El Anatsui's work, now on display in the Brooklyn Museum of Art, has perhaps changed as a consequence of your trip to Africa and the thinking you've done as a consequence of it. Mm. Would well, you talk to us about your perceptions of his work? Yes, uh, so we're talking about El, uh, um, El, El Anatsui, who has, is a, um, an African uh, artist born in um, Ghana and now living in Nigeria, who has a show now at the Brooklyn Museum, a retrospective at the Brooklyn Museum, and also has a very large installation down, downtown in Chelsea on the side of a building. And um, he's in his 60s now, and this is a big moment for him. Um, he's, the show is, I think, absolutely smashing. Uh, I first saw his work back in the early 1990s when um, a, gallery, a gallery called Scoto Gallery uh, opened on Prince Street. It was a tiny storefront gallery. And uh, Skoto at that point showed El Anatsui uh, before his metal pieces were being made. These, I, if you're not familiar with these pieces, they're, they're huge uh, textile looking um, hangings. And they're made from little tiny bits of metal and all those bits of metal are um, recycled bottle caps from liquor bottles that he collects um, far and wide in, in Nigeria. And has, he has a workshop there. He has a, a staff that takes these uh, liquor bottles, tops, and uh, twists them and pounds them and makes them into just tiny shapes, and then st uh, stitches them together with copper wire and into blocks about this may foot by a foot. Then Ellen Tsui comes and chooses the blocks and arranges those into the larger hangings. And the hangings can be enormous. They can be like the size of this screen here or larger. Um, they, they really just gorgeous, and the colors are brilliant, and so forth. Um, and I was very, one thing I was very aware of when I was in uh, <coughs> Africa was, was this, this whole phenomenon of, phenomenon of recycling. And so I wanted to see some of this firsthand, so I went to the, um, 
to the uh, to the iron workers market in 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 Bamako, where you see extraordinary things happening daily with people taking scrap metal and turning them into um, art objects or tools, you know, into plows and kitchen utensils and bowls and so forth. And it's happening nonstop all the time. It's, it's a remarkable thing to, to, to watch. So he's coming out of that. Out of that. Um, he was also formerly a painter, so he's also coming out of a painterly place. He went to art school in, in Ghana, uh, was traditional academic education. So he's putting all this stuff together in these, in these beautiful things. And originally, as I say, I saw him, he was working in wood, he was carving wood, little tiny wood pieces, but the, the continuous thing was those wood pieces were made in, in segments. They were meant to be, you, whoever got that wood piece, if you bought it, you could put it whatever formation you wanted. That was the idea. If he wasn't around, you could make, it, make your own thing out of it. So he's kept that, that idea of, 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 a f of flexibility uh, as a part of his work. And <coughs> I just love it. I think it's really beautiful. You know. um, but there, there are a lot of great artists in Africa, though. He's not the only one. I, I hasten to say that, because too often, the market lands on one artist, and that's the artist you know about. Ai Weiwei. Everybody knows Ai Weiwei, right? There's, believe me when I tell you, there are many, many great artists working in China right now, as there are in Africa. So we've, we've got to keep, um, you know, but there are no galleries in New York who, who will show them. Skota will show some, because he's still in business. India is the same thing. You know, we, the wonderful artists in India, but we've, we've lost our Indian galleries. We've got, we've got one left who shows, regularly shows contemporary Indian art, and he's well on East 16th Street on the other side of the park, and he's hard to find, and blah, blah, blah. And now, he, you know, anyway, so. <laughs> but there's, there's a ton to see, tons. But it turns out you have to go there now to see it. That's, that's the problem, or you don't see it. So yeah, El's great, but you know, there's a lot where El came from. He'll, he's the first person to tell you that. <laughs> you know, he's a great guy. I had a, a question. Yes. I had a question about um, your, your trip to Mali and your interest in uh, Dogon masks. Yeah. It, um, I, I find it um, kind of strange when, when we visit museums in New York, we, we'll, we see masks, we see African masks in, in the museum, but we don't have any connection to the, the performance that takes place with these masks. And I was just really curious about when, when you went to Mali and you saw these Dogon masks performances. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about that? I, I find it, it's, it's, it's very strange to me that we see these things so utterly divorced from their, their meaning, what, what, they're, what they're actually used for. It would almost be like um, you know, exhibiting props from a Shakespearean play in another culture. They, they don't mean anything. I agree. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> That's, yeah, it was a real, it was wonderful to be there to see that, because that was my experience of those masks, too, apart from films. Um, that was the only time I'd seen them actually move. And um, uh, in, in, in Dogon country there in Bandiagara area, uh, the deal is you, you call ahead and you commission a performance. And to the, you call ahead to the village and you commission a performance and you say what time you'll be there and they will perform perform. It's about a 45 minute performance. It's, as, a, as I mentioned, a distillation of a much, much longer um, uh, uh, performance. But it, it's, it's for real. It's, it's, it's the real McCoy. It's the real thing, you know. And you're seeing these amazing things moving. Um, they've, they've selected maybe the most, out of, out of the huge range of masks that they, they make, types, uh, they, they select maybe, I think, something like 20 to perform for, a, in this kind of commissioned performance. So you're not seeing the entire range of masks, but you're seeing them moving, and you're seeing them interacting, because they all represent mythological characters, or animals, or so forth, so they don't st none of them stands alone. They're, they all have roles that they play in, in relationship to each other. It's important to know, you, you can't know that from a museum. Um, but you can know that from, from seeing them in, in this kind of situation. Um, I think it was what the Museum for African Art was trying to convey when it was doing its shows. Um, it did other shows where it let people come in and, and handle material. Um, it, just, it, it just tried to completely um, uh, destabilize your, your, your um, preconceptions of what of a mask as a, as, as a museum object. 
They, try, they, they would put it up in the way up there. They would light it funny ways. They would let you touch it. They would, you know, have films going on around it. Anything to kind of get you out of this, this, sta this stationary mode. And um, <clears throat> nobody's doing that now. They, as with so many things in the 1990s and 1980s and 90s, we seem to be in a backsliding position on this. So museums are no longer doing adventurous things like this. Uh, I, I don't understand it. And the, unfortunately, the Museum for African Art is now closed, effectively. Um, it exists in a, in, a, in, a, in a loft space in Queens. It has a building up on, on the top of Fifth Avenue and 109th Street. But it can't get it together economically to open its doors. And this has been that for three, four years. It has a staff. <laughs> it, it, it organizes shows, but those shows are all traveling elsewhere. Um, so at someday, hopefully, once, once it gets its act together, because Susan left years ago, um, it will open again and we'll have, we'll have a great museum here in the city, an adventurous museum here in the city. But it was the only one d doing that. It, 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 it is, it's because of it that the Met even shows films in his African galleries now occasionally. We'll show a video. It was because of that example. But uh, yeah, you, you just gotta, you gotta go looking for those films. That's the only way to, s to see those things move, unfortunately. And it makes a all the difference, because that's what they're about. Yeah, I am one of those uh, volunteers of the 60s kind of persons and freelance photographer. I've gone back and forth to West Africa frequently and I visited the mosque in Jenne and I'm sad to hear what <laughs> what's hap what you're describing and I'm oh, wondering. I've got good news. <laughs> is, yeah, I was just, that's my question. Is yeah. there any internal discussion and uh, non-acceptance <laughs> of the uh, Aga Khan Foundation's um, Yeah. Major, major internal discussion. Yeah, very angry people, yeah. <laughs> which is great. So the, the citizens of Jenne um, uh, got, got together and they have, they're doing their, they're doing, they did the f um, first in f six years replastering last year. So they're back. The, 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 huh? Well, sort of like that, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're, they're glad that, they're, that the Aga Khan did, did what they did, but, you know, n enough already. So they're, it's now back in operation. And, you know, s at some point, they may have to call it off and have a, re a, a new conservation thing done. Okay, well, we'll wait till that happens. But at the moment, it's, it's back working. And, and it, crucially, of course, because the tourism just vanished. The tourism was gone when I was there because of this, of the northern problems. And um, there was, you know, was kidnappings and all kinds of fun weird things going on. So tourists were just not going there. People were really suffering. But um, yeah, so they needed that. That yeah, and they got it. Yeah, I enjoyed your talk. I hope I can get a copy of your uh, uh, she read from um, Rob Ferris Thompson. Um, is uh, deals with both African and African American art. I would like to know what your assessment is or how you, how you track the African-American art coming out of Africa over these centuries and sometimes not so many centuries, uh, sometimes fairly uh, recent trans, trans, transatlantic situation involving African-American art in America. Do you have any? Um. Well, uh, yes, as the way, <coughs> I'll tell you how Bob did it. Uh, uh, Bob does it or did it. Um, he's still working. And a lot of his, um, the altars, for example, were altars that uh, were, were created um, originally in Africa, and, or not the altars themselves, but the, the type of altar, and then came to Brazil or, or to the Caribbean and were recreated differently there. And those were the altars he was particularly interested in that showed um, signs of an African origin and then came here and became hybrid um, American creations. And I, 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 uh, the catalog still exists. It's out there and it's wonderful to see because it's vivid in the pictures um, how these things connect up. He would show the African original and African original and then he would show the, the uh, Caribbean version of it or whatever and the transformation was extraordinary. So that's the best way to get a a, a grip on it, I think, is to look at the pictures. It's probably the best way to get a grip on everything is to look at pictures. <laughs> what, about, what, about, what about your take on uh, African-American art? 
or uh, coming out of Africa, so to speak? Um, uh, well, I, th I think s I think some does. Um, I think I think actually Bob Thompson, as a painter, would be a good example of somebody who had looked very carefully, for example, at um, at African sculpture, and he was looking at Piero della Francesca, and he was looking at African sculpture, and to him they were both equally beautiful. So what he did was he kind of put them together, and you get these beautiful uh, Piero versions of 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 um, African sculptures, and that's one example I can give. I, I think there are others, too. Yeah. It, does that answer your... You, you pointed out that a lot of African art is in context. It is done in relationship to celebrations or ceremonies or the death, life, birth, all kinds of things. And so the artist is not necessarily the point. And that results often in places where people think there isn't any, isn't, isn't art, because it isn't shown as art. It's just part of life. I will mention that there's presently an exhibit of the art of Tanzania at the Queensboro Community College. Um, and even my Tanzanian friends didn't think their country had much art. But it has been collected here and is, is quite wonderful. Um, and the book mentions the politics, the culture, as well as the art in, in its, and I want to, but you have done that in, in some of your work too. Um, when you reviewed the art at that um, Mission Museum in Tenafly, New Jersey, uh, that is a, muse a museum that where the missionaries have brought, um, have valued the art as and culture, as many missionaries have not, uh, and it, it, the art probably isn't so great, but they very much put it in context of the meaning of of the objects and the art, so that at least some places do try to establish the context and the meaning, even more than the art, in quotes per se. I agree. Um, uh, she was talking about uh, two museums. One is at Queensboro Community College, which is um, pretty far out in, in Brooklyn, right? Or near Queens, near the Long Island border. Yes, is that about right? Uh, but it has, um, it's in an old um, go golf club, actually, the, this, the, the, the campus. And they've turned the original clubhouse of the golf club, I think this is right, into a museum. They happen to have a wonderful collection of African art, which is growing. Am I right? Yeah, yes. And they put on superb shows. The, the show that's on now, the, the show of Tanzanian art, is put on by a guy named Gary Van, Van Vick. Uh, Gary is, um, used to uh, run a gallery, no longer does, so he's South African. He used to have a gallery in Chelsea uh, called Axis Gallery. He was with his wife, who was a, anyway. Uh, he's, uh, he's, a, he's got a PhD from Columbia. And he has put this show together. I, can, I haven't seen this show. I've seen other shows there. It, they're wonderful, really wonderful. Uh, no kidding. Uh, and worth the, the, the trip out there to see. And the SMA Fathers over in Tenafly, New Jersey, also have oh, their, their monasteries there. It's called a monastery, I think. And a church and a museum. And that museum is specifically built to house the collections of, that the SMA Fathers put together over the years in Africa, many of the pieces, or some of the pieces in those shows are commissions from the MS, SM, SMA fathers uh, of uh, woodcarvers, uh, Yoruba woodcarvers, and they've kept those. So that was also a, a thrill to visit, I find. I've been there several times and, and like it a lot. So there are two places, <laughs> you have to travel a bit, but they're worth it, they're, 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 they're really worth it. And they're like no museum you'll go to, that's another good thing, they're, <laughs> you know, they're really something. Yeah, love it, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, I'd like to thank you for bringing your voice and sensibility here. I'm really enjoying it. And your story uh, made me think of something. It's kind of a reckless, half-baked sort of question, if it's a question yet. But um, when you were talking about your experience with museums and one of the experiences we all have here in the United States or in Europe is Art is kind of held captive in these boxes, in museums, in galleries. I mean, 
the museum almost goes back to places like Versailles where the rich or the well, you know, took all this art and collected it. And so it's a really powerful kind of um, magnifying glass. It really says, look at this. But anybody who's involved in any kind of art practice knows that's not really where it's, where it's at. That's not what we do. That's not how we live. That's not how, how it happens. But we seem to need the box. Some of it's economic. Some of it's a matter of uh, attention and emphasis, you know, that frame. And yet when you go, when you go to Africa, where they haven't really played with that, except when it's been imported, like in Zimbabwe, um, it, it saturates, it moves around. The whole knowledge base is different for people. In some ways, we're more impoverished here in terms of what we can know, because you have to keep going past this fence before you can actually get to know it. Anyway, that, that's almost the question, but I'm just if you can kind of freestyle on that idea and tell me what your experience has, has done going back and forth and what's happened. Yeah, well, you know, I, 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 as I say, you know, this is real. The going there has been a real challenge for my, for for my, um, my preconceptions of how uh, art should be presented, where it should be presented, all of that has changed um, for me amazingly. Um, the museum, the National Museum in Mali, for example, has a textile collection, a textile display, a, a very large textile, it's a fairly large textile display, and has some very old antique textiles, little little bits of tellum stuff. But most of this display is of uh, contemporary f fabrics that you could go out into the marketplace and buy examples of. They aren't very old. But the display is very beautiful. And um, suddenly you walk from that museum, you go out to the market, well, you're, you're in a museum again. You're in, you know, it's interchangeable here. You know, you can, uh, there's no difference. This is life in here, look at it here. You go out there and look at it. You can buy it out there. You know, it's real, and but here you come. The museum has chosen to kind of highlight it for you a bit, and you can take a look and admire it. And maybe this is this is an old version of uh, something that's on sale out there now, so you get that perspective on it. It's really w a wonderful um, um, mm, interactive, not physically, but although yes, it is physical because you can go to the market and you can you you feel everything, touch everything, you know. So, uh, yeah. It's just a, a different uh, sense of the, of the value of uh, of the life around you. And I, I must say, one <laughs> apropos of museums, though, one of my, one of my amazing experiences was um, I, when I was a teen when I was not a teenager, I was a college student, graduate student. I was in studying art history, and I said to the Asia Society, "I'd like to um, docent one summer for you." They were doing going to do the Rockefeller collection. They were happening to do the Rockefeller South Asian collection. So it was my stuff, right? So I went to them, I said, I would like to docent for you, and I'll, of course it's for free, and so forth and so on, I'm very reliable, I'll show up, blah, blah, blah. And I said, there's only one catch I have to ask of you. I want to help install the show. <laughs> so they agreed. <laughs> all I wanted to do, all I wanted to do was one thing. I wanted to pick up those objects. I wanted to feel the weight of those objects. I wanted to feel what a chola bronze felt like as opposed to a stone, you know, carving. And so they let me move these. All I would do, one, I, it was, they were all in one big room. I moved from one to here, one there, and I got to feel the weight of those things. And that was a remarkable experience for me. It suddenly, it was like uh, the difference between seeing somebody across the room and going and giving them a hug, you know. You, you just don't, you don't forget it. So there's some kind of magic thing going on there. I don't know quite what it is, but it's it's there. I don't Alan, know if that's a help, but yeah. yeah. Alan, I'd like to keep you here from now on, and I think I'm going to try to figure out how to do, how to make that happen, but I think <laughs> now we have to leave. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs>